Um, I'm conscious that um, we're running out of time and that we're all standing between you and your food. Uh, and so I'm going to try and uh, move along as quickly as I can. Um, I want to share with you um, my thoughts on issues and challenges in student exchanges. And I want to do this um, partly by reflecting on my own experience. I first came to India in 1981 when I was a PhD student studying in the UK and I came to the University of Calcutta because my PhD was on Swami Vivekananda and I was looking at the relationship between tradition and modernity. So I arrived as a PhD student, arrived at a university, my first time in India, my first time, the only other overseas trip I'd ever done was to Paris for a weekend. So I arrived nervous, apprehensive, enthusiastic, really excited to finally be in the country of the person I'd already been studying for two years, but at a distance. I also want to share my experience now because I supervise a great number of international students. Um, I have about 10 international PhD students now, and I and learning from that as well. So what I want to do is actually to focus on two things which previous speakers have already mentioned. I want to focus on the tacit knowledge and the tacit understanding that's so important in learning and how that is both challenged in international contexts and how international contexts are very rich ways of bringing to the surface a lot of assumptions. And that's not always comfortable. And I also want to hit upon the idea that why bother? What's the point? Because I think that's another very important question. Um, India has a perfectly good education system of its own. The UK has a perfectly good education system of its own. We are saying that we can learn from each other, but why should students be exchanged between countries in order to pursue that learning? So I want to try and pick upon those things. I wanted to show you a picture of Glasgow. It does sometimes have a blue sky. <laughs> Not often, but sometimes. So that's my university. The fourth oldest university in the English-speaking world, but not a match for the oldest universities in India. And I wanted, first of all, to make the point that the whole thing about being a student is to actually develop critical thinking. That's the point. But critical thinking is also cultural thinking. And that's what this slide is trying to actually illustrate. What we think learning is, and what we think being a good learner is, what we think good teaching is, and what we think a good teacher is, there are commonalities across systems, but there are differences. So here's a teacher who thinks that talking a lot in class is a good thing because clearly a socio-constructivist and believes that it's through talking together that we learn, and says, your son is talking well in class. He is speaking up a lot. This is meant to be praise. And the parent says, I'm sorry. <laughs> because the parent thinks, how can you be learning if he's talking all the time? So the first thing to be aware of is that what we think is important and what we think critical thinking is, is culturally specific to perhaps a greater extent than we sometimes acknowledge. I find this sometimes when I'm talking to my colleagues and I'm sure if we're honest, we've all got colleagues who don't actually like teaching international students. They find it difficult teaching international students and they sometimes complain about it. And I think to myself that actually a student studying outside of their own country is going to be in the top percent of students anywhere because they've actually been excellent enough to get the funding to go and study overseas, not just study in their own country. They've got the 
initiative to be prepared to go somewhere else, and in most cases, they're studying in not their first language. They're not studying in their home language, they're studying in a foreign language. Those students have got to be in the top percentage of any class. So why is it difficult to teach them? I think it's difficult to teach them because of this tacit assumption about what it means to learn, about what we think knowledge is. Because actually the context in which we learn and in the context we have learned up until that point, not only shapes how we learn, it shapes what we learn. Because everybody hears and thinks and sees different things and culturally that can shape how you understand things. When I first started studying, um, when I came to India, I've got certain habits, certain ways of working, certain assumptions, and they didn't fit. And it made it very difficult. I had to learn to be a good student in a different context. And it wasn't necessarily all the things I'd learned in the previous context. I just wanted to flag up, and we haven't got much time, I just wanted to flag up what I think some of these culturally specific differences can be. Um, we have in the UK, and I think perhaps more widely in the West, we have an idea about it's all about individual thinking. It's all about being an individual. It's all about having a new idea, all of your own, that nobody else has ever thought of, which I've always thought was a pretty impossible task. Every single PhD that's ever been written is meant to make an original contribution to knowledge. Is that realistic? Does anybody ever make an original contribution to knowledge? Whereas in some cultures and systems, actually what's important is not what you think, but how we think together. It's a collective understanding, not individual. Another part of the individual collective is in the West, I was a political science student, and there in the Western tradition, it was all about being argumentative. It was all about setting up an argument, knocking it down, and setting up a new argument, not cumulative and building. So there are differences in cultures between individuality and collectivism. About being original versus emulating. And I sometimes have difficulties with students who think that to copy is the highest praise, whereas in our system it's called plagiarism and you get into trouble. So originality versus emulation, that's another tension. Being adversarial versus being cumulative, knocking your opponent's argument down rather than building on it. Being rational versus being integrative. And I think that's something that I learned from studying Indian educationalists. The idea that it's not just about rationality, it's about being integ integrating different aspects. So Aravindo being perhaps one of the most famous advocates of integrated education. So we have these different things, and that, I think, is one of the challenges, but it's also what's interesting. So in answering my own question, why bother, I think it's interesting to have these encounters because it brings a tacit to the surface, it makes these assumptions open to challenge, and it makes everybody think about what are we actually valuing and what's important about that. And I'm a, a great advocate of John Dewey, so I think we should deny dichotomies, those of you who also know the work of John Dewey. He said, we don't waste time looking at dichotomies, we deny them. We say, hang on a minute, why has it got to be either or? Why can't it be both and? Something else that the Indians taught the rest of the world, an argument standing on four feet. So if we actually deny the dichotomy, I think it opens up some interesting things. For a start, I don't think this is a simple cultural difference. I actually think it's a gendered difference, and I don't want to get into too much debate now, but I do think there are differences between the way women and men learn and are taught and construct arguments and interact with each other. And I also think social class 
has an influence. I think the way that people from working class, working craft backgrounds, and the way intellectuals think is different and equally valuable. My father was a bricklayer all his life. He, he worked with bricks, he built houses. I'm the only person ever to go to university, and my family think I'm the stupidest member of the family. <laughs> they say I have no common sense whatsoever. Um, so I think we need to deny these dichotomies and say there are differences between people, there are cultural differences, there are gender differences, there are social class differences. The more that we interact and exchange views, then the more that we become aware of these and the more interesting the debate can become. But back to my question. If you go to the UK to study as a student, how British should that experience be? Because if you can have a perfectly good education by staying at home, then if you go to the UK, what are you going there to learn? You're going there to go, hopefully, to a good university, to be taught by good teachers, but you could have stayed at home and done that. You're going to learn about a new country. That's interesting. But is there anything that should be specific? And what I'm very interested in, and it's what I'm researching at the moment, is this internationalisation could lead to the development of what I'm calling hybrid scholarly traditions. In other words, that if you go to the UK, it's to have a UK experience, but it's also to reflect on your Indian experience, and it's actually to think about the similarities and differences, and it may be that we will start to create new kinds of students and teachers through this hybridization of scholarly traditions, keeping things separate, yes, speed up, keeping things separate but allowing them to interact in a meaningful way. And to think about uh, being a student and teaching students as a kind of cognitive apprenticeship in the sense that what you're doing is understanding the social practice of academic study. You're learning the content of what you're doing, you're gaining a qualification, but you're also learning about a different practice of academic study. And you're being inducted in that in the most meaningful and direct way possible, which is not by reading about it, but actually experience it for yourself. And so understanding that social practice of academic study is enriching because it can help you to actually move forward. I'm involved in a lot of research um, at the moment. We have a research group which looks at home international research. And the reason we're doing that is because particularly in education, which is my field, um, we think about these things a lot. So we've got a very interesting social experiment going on at the moment in the United Kingdom. We're not the United Kingdom anymore, don't know if you've noticed. Um, we've always been four nations and politically we're now becoming four nations because of devolution. So we've got a nice little laboratory going on because we've got an education system which has a lot in common in the United Kingdom. And so lots of the things that can distract from comparative research aren't there, but we've actually got four nations. So home international, I don't know how popular rugby is in India, probably not very popular at all, but the big tournament in rugby playing is the home internationals where you get um, the four nations of the UK, the four nations cup. And so what we're interested in is what happens in an education system which was united and is now becoming disunited and it's becoming disunited through devolution which is a cultural and political phenomenon so as Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland and England become more different, education systems are more different. You heard earlier today, Scotland, students who are born and live in Scotland don't pay fees. They're going to graduate with no debt at all, whereas their colleagues, their other students in England, for example, are going to start their working life with a debt of £57,000. That's an interesting social experiment all on its own. So I'm interested in actually looking at when you try and look at bringing these things together, 
what actually begins to happen. It's a fascinating, I think, area of research. And one of the things that we learn when we put these things into juxtaposition is all education systems, and I'm drawing upon Basil Bernstein now, a sociologist of education, he says, if you want to understand an education system, look at how it handles the three message systems. Curriculum, what's important enough to be learnt, pedagogy, how do we learn and how should we teach, and assessment, what do we value and how do we judge whether something is of value. All education systems have to manage the dynamic and interaction between those three things. And I think what is very interesting is the way that that happens within any education system. As soon as you get students exchanging between systems, the first thing that has to happen is we all have to do some arm wrestling. If I went to the University of Calcutta, the University of London, where I was studying, had to agree that my time there was going to count. And this is what happens now. We have to accept each other's credit ratings, we've got to accept each other's allocations, and we have to say, yes, a student studying there, it's just as good a system as studying with me. So how do we actually negotiate those things? And I think one thing that we can learn from these home international comparisons, these exchanges, this evolution perhaps of hybrid scholarship is learn a lot about what happens to the relationship between curriculum, pedagogy and assessment when you have international student exchange. And the last thing I would want to say is what we're asking of students is huge. We're asking them to learn an awful lot in a very short space of time, and we're often asking them to learn it in a foreign language. And we know that the most difficult skill is synthesis and evaluation. And how much more difficult is that to do when you're trying to do that in a different culture, with a different language, with a different set of rules and circumstances? And I've always loved this quote from Blaise Pascal. And it's perhaps a lesson to me because I've got to shut up. <laughs> Thank you.